start recording. And uh, thank you everyone for, for dropping in today for our uh, Wikidata LD4 Affinity Group talk as part of the 2022 LD4 conference on linking global knowledge. Um, very glad to see you all here. I'll give a quick introduction. Um, share my screen. And our agenda. Um, let me move some stuff around. So this is our agenda. We have some links at the top for our group web page where you can find information about our upcoming calls uh, for the affinity group calls, the Wikidata working hours, and the Wikibase working hours. Um, there's a link to the Wiki there's project. We only see your blue screen. We don't. Oh, see I'm sorry. Um, Better. How about, okay, thank you. <laughs> um, yes, across the top there. And then that's for our current call. If you'd like to and you feel comfortable uh, putting your name under the attendance, that helps us keep track of kind of who we're reaching. And if you don't have to, uh, we would like to welcome everyone, go through a few announcements. Um, the Metadata Justice in Oklahoma Libraries and Archives Symposium is happening this Thursday, July 14th. That's hosted by Chambers Library University of Central Oklahoma. And there's a link there if you'd like to register for that. Our next Wikidata Working Hour will be Friday, July 18th. Um, they're working on a series of working hours to give people an opportunity to try out various Wikidata related skills and tools uh, concerning items uh, from the Cooperative Children's Book Center at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And our next Wikidata and Wikibase office hours will be Wednesday, July 27th. Uh, there's a link there, and they're uh, always very valuable. Uh, does anyone else have any other announcements they'd like to add? Just feel free to unmute yourself and go ahead. Okay, not hearing any, I'll, uh, we're always uh, looking for help. If you'd like to join the affinity group and help help us organize it, um, there are links to our Slack channels. I see I did not update our next call, uh, but if you join the Slack channel and there is a link at the top there, we always welcome your input and any ideas you might have. So with that, I will welcome our, so I'll stop sharing, uh, welcome our speaker, and thank you all again. There is a link to that agenda in the chat. Hello, everyone. So I will start by sharing my screen. Yeah. Yeah, here we go. So hello, everyone. I am glad to be here today to present some of the work I am doing for a while now about using bibliographic metadata for enriching and validating Wikidata. So I am Hussein in Turkey. I am a research assistant at Data Engineering Semantics Research Unit at the University of Sfax Tunisia, and I am as well the vice chair of Wikimedia Tunisia user group. So the Data Engineering and Semantics Research Unit has been created in 2021 as the first research structure in Tunisia specialized in Wikimedia projects. It is affiliated at the Faculty of Sciences of SFAX, University of SFAX Tunisia, and its main objective is to develop novel applications of Wikimedia projects based on knowledge engineering, machine learning, and big data technologies. So our team is composed of uh, researchers from various fields, region from medicine to computer science to library and information science. And you have collaborators for this project from different universities, from the Wikimedia world, as well as from the machine learning community, especially in Africa. And we are working on to develop our project within the framework of uh, our uh, initiative entitled Adapting Wikidata to Support Clinical Practice 
using data science, semantic web, and machine learning, which has been funded recently by Wikimedia Research Fund. And that will be launched soon in August, in this August, for one year. Let's now go to our presentation. So as you already know, Wikidata has been created in October 20, uh, 2012. It represents uh, structured knowledge in the form of RDF triples. This means subject, predicate, and object. It is findable, it is accessible, it is interoperable, and it is reusable. It is easy available at wikidata.org, and it, it includes items that are covering a significant subset of the human knowledge, ranging from cultural heritage to biomedicine. Items there are aligned to external biomedical resources such as PubMed, Mesh, UMLS, Metatizorus, etc. And Wikidata statements are supported by references for verifiability. When it comes to quantifying the biomedical knowledge in Wikidata, we see that various types of biomedical items are represented. We have human genes and proteins, diseases, drugs, therapies, anatomical structure, symptoms, etc. as you see here on the right top. Multiple languages as well are covered. However, there is a bias towards European and Asian languages. There is an even coverage, ladies and gentlemen, for, the, for natural languages that are mainly uh, existing and available across the internet. For example, English, French, German, and Dutch. And there is an even distribution of the types of biomedical entities in Wikidata as it is submerged by human genes and proteins, diseases, and drugs. Well, to analyze the and to reuse the data, the biomedical information inside Wikidata, we use, for example, Wikidata query service, as well as the MediaWiki API. And this allows us to find insights about the data. This means that we synthesize data based on integrated information about different aspects of information as supported by Wikidata. We extract a specific piece of, of knowledge about a particular topic uh, of interest. And as well, we parse Wikidata to validate the data. We find inconsistencies based on predefined rules that have been defined using checks, shackle, prot uh, property constraints, and other tools. And we compare data with their equivalent in external knowledge graph to verify their accuracy. Well, the other of Wikidata, because it uses the wiki style, is that it is easily extensible. Everyone can create new, new items and statements. Everyone can apply uh, for new properties to support novel types of items. There is an easy creation of data models and property constraints to ensure the data consistencies. We can easily align items to external resources. There is an, an intuitive way for embedding Wikidata knowledge in bots for the automatic enrichment of Wikidata. And there is a possible change of data models in upon community consent. As you see on the right here, we see how huge data about COVID-19 has evolved during the last two years. As you see, even that the disease has emerged Two years ago, we have a huge variety of knowledge uh, regarding the disease. We, it includes uh, epidemiological data, uh, information about tracing apps and dashboards, genes, proteins, taxons, etc. Well, the main issue about Wikidata, as we said before, is that there is somehow an even distribution of the types of biomedical entities. As biomedical entities are dominated by genes and proteins. But there is another problem, and it is the 
the reference support for the Wikidata statements in the biomedical knowledge. Because except of genes, proteins, disease, human enzymes, drug classes, and drug, the other classes are mainly poorly supported by references. As you see here, muscles, uh, statements about muscles are only supported by reference in 4% of the cases. There is also, also the statements about medical specialties that is that are supported by references at a rate of 19% only. So what Wikidata really, really needs? It needs a way to uh, allow relation extraction, relation classification, relation validation, and reference identification from text, resources, etc to ameliorate the quality and the consistency of the data available. So what we can do is that we can use scholarly publications. And there is a load of scholarly publications that are published each year. So I have made a simple query for major bibliographic databases. And I found that in 2020, there is 1.6 million of papers of publications that have been issued and indexed by PubMed, 3.5 million that are indexed by Web of Science, as well as 3.8 million of papers that have been indexed by data sites. So research publications include four texts. And, uh, and as you see here, the, it is nonsense to analyze all these full texts because the full text include detailed text in natural language involved insights about study context, results, and outcomes. There are, it is of a huge size. It requires extensive use of advanced technique of natural language processing and machine learning. And the papers include tables, diagrams, images that increase the complexity of their managers. By contrast, the bibliographic metadata that exists in the bibliographic databases are semi-structured text providing information about the research venue, the paper, and the others in a nutshell. They have a limited size, they are pre-processed, and requires minor use of information retrieval and machine learning techniques. And they are even formatted and annotated by design. So why not using them? So just if to give you an idea about what, what are the bibliographic metadata that can be that can exist in uh, in a database, for example, I have uh, I have kind of uh, taken a screenshot of the types of uh, bibliographic uh, information that are issued in PubMed re records. So as you see here, there are abstracts, others, for example, statements about the publication statu, uh, status. That means that whether the paper is retracted or not, etc. So lots of useful information. And that information can be used to enrich bibliographic metadata in Wikidata. For example, the Wikisite, uh, for instance, the Wikisite project. However, there are some legal concerns related to that. But however, the most important thing is that we can process this data in order to enrich and ameliorate the scientific knowledge in Wikidata. And that's what we are dealing with during this session. So as an example, as a case study, I have taken the mesh keywords. The mesh keywords are controlled keywords as seen to uh, PubMed records by the curator of NCBI databases. They are easy to process. They have a particular layout, heading slash qualifier. And the mesh qualifier are predefined. There are 89 predefined qualifiers. And the mesh headings are assigned from the medical subject heading taxonomy. So they have a structure. There is 
uh, not a possibility of having a kind of synonyms or something like that. There is no such problem of label granularity, etc. They are shorter than the full text and abstract of a scholarly publication, that's uh, evident, and they reflect the output of scholarly publication, and they can be retrieved thanks to the NCBI, Entree ABI, and the Vue Python, Python library. So why not using them to enrich and ameliorate Wikidata? So I have tried that during, with my collaborators, during kind of three years now. And I will show you some of the results we had. Okay, let's start about the re relation classification. So we proposed an approach for relation classification ba based on mesh keywords. So the principal example is that we try to, to find the associations between the keywords, for example, hepatitis C and subosphifir, and we are trying to analyze the qualifiers of the subject and the object in order to induce the relation type for the Wikidata statement. So we, we have built a database for that using Wikidata and PubMed. So to do that, we had kind of use a uh, feature of Wikidata. In fact, we have extracted the taxonomic and non-taxonomic relations of Wikidata. And we have uh, kind of uh, extracted the property constraints of the relations in order to uh, classify them according to five classes, taxonomic, for example, uh, biomedical non-relation, uh, non-symmetric, biomedical symmetric, uh, non-biomedical non-symmetric, etc. And we have finally extracted the table of equivalence between the, the Wikidata item and the mesh item based on the mesh descriptor ID statements, as you see here below. So we have formulated a Sparkle query accordingly. So we have extracted the relations in Wikidata between items that are represented in the mesh taxonomy. And we have searched for the associations between subject and object in PubMed. And we have up, uh, extracted the association of the qualifiers of the sub subject to qualifiers and the object qualifiers. The qualifier is the thing after the slash. This reflects a facet of, of the item that is represented by the mesh term, as you see here. After that, based on the qualifier associations between up to 100 publication, we trace this state of response between subject qualifier and object qualifiers, and we assign them the, the relation type, which is the same, uh, which is the same relation type as, uh, as in Wikidata. For example, if the relation type is symptom, page 780, the relation here, the label is P780, these symptoms, it is the same thing as in Wikidata. And we store all this data, uh, all these matrices and labels in the mesh to matrix data set that we have created. After the We, we have used our data set to train machine learning models for the 195 relation types and for the five superclasses that I explained before. The, they are the general classes of relation types. And we trained that on three benchmarking uh, machine learning models and we evaluated our re results based on evaluation metrics. So the models that we have uh, thought of, there is the fully collected or dense model, so used as a regularization method and ReLU as 
uh, an activation function between input and hidden layer, and it uses softmax as an activation function on the output layer. We also uh, used kind of classical machine learning model, that is the CPART vector machine. That is a model that is best suited for samples with many features because of their ability to learn uh, independently of the feature space. So we, we have used here 7,921 feature vectors for that. And the third one is one is, is that is common, commonly used for image classification, but we have used, the, used it for, uh, uh, for the, our, our matrix classification, which is the, uh, which is the convolutional neural networks. So it is kind of classical architecture, but it is a deep learning architecture indeed. So we are, we are having two steps here, feature extraction from matrix and classification. So we use convolution and then ReLU, pooling, then convolution and ReLU, then pooling, then fully connected layer, then another fully connected layer, and then the output prediction. So for the, the evaluation metrics, we are using the accuracy and the F1 scores. They are classical uh, metrics for evaluating uh, the, the, out, the output of machine learning models. So from, what, uh, for, from our experience, we have seen that uh, our, our method have been uh, interestingly uh, kind of uh, kind of successful to generate a data set of around uh, 28, 29,000 uh, matrices. So mo most of them, as you see, there is kind of lot gain uh, distribution here. So there are some of, of most of the uh, of the sample is is generated upon a fewer number of publications, and then there are a number of of uh, papers of uh, of uh, matrices that are generated upon one hundred publication or more. So when we applied our uh, our machine learning models to our data set that is composed around around uh, of around what to uh, 29000 samples uh, we got ca kind of good results in fact for the a svm we have got an accuracy of around 66% uh, for the for the detailed classification and for the general classification, we have got a, uh, an accuracy rate of 78%. These values are better for the convolution neural networks, and they are the best for the dense model here. As you see here, there is an accuracy rate of 70% for the detailed classification and 83% for the five superclasses. So uh, the, this work has been already published, and for reproducibility purposes, we made our code source available and uh, and accessible for anyone at GitHub. So everyone who would like to access our code and see how it works, uh, they are welcome. We I'm also collaborating with Sison Computec, which which is the the African machine learning community and people there are are kind of happy to help uh, answering your question or or solving problems in regard to mesh to matrix etc. Let's move to another thing, another way to use the mesh keywords, which is the relation extraction and validation. So as 
uh, mesh keywords are kind sample stru structures. They are kind of not complicated and not complex as uh, as the semantic uh, information. So for that, we, it is simple to use the pointwise mutual information, which is the metric, a simple metric for uh, that measures the association between entities. And this uh, metric has been used in uh, computation linguistics for a long time to find collocation and associations between words. And as mesh keywords are predefined and formatted, there is no need for advanced methods for identifying associations. So this kind of statistical and probabilistic approach is the best and can work effectively in this city. So we have, so we search for, for that. And then we extract the most common mesh keywords that are existed, that exist for, in the search results of the query, of the PubMed query. And then we compute the PMI between the mesh keywords. And then based on comparing the PMI values and the relations in Wikidata, uh, we find out the kind of the threshold that is used to, deter to determine to identify if the, the if uh, association is correct or not. And then we find the relation types between the mesh keywords using the, uh, uh, the mesh to matrix uh, data set we discussed before, but with a little change. So that's for the extraction. So for the validation, the way is very simple. Uh, very simple. Uh, so we just uh, extract the subject and the object, and we find their uh, their equivalence in mesh, and then we formulate the query. We search for them in PubMed, and then we compute the PMI between them, and then identify if they they are they reach the threshold or or not. And by that, we use the same method for the validation of re the relations. Just uh, kind of explain more about how I'm building types for. Uh, so uh, what we what we do here is that we consider the relation the we sample the mesh to matrix data set. By considering the relation types corresponding to the classes of the mesh keywords, for, for example, if the subject is a drag and the object is a drag, so the, the relation type cannot be symptoms, for example. It can be, for example, uh, drag interactions, for example. It can be another thing. It can be, for example, uh, for example, uh, for example, association, like association between uh, between drugs for a given treatment. Um, I'm sorry so, to interrupt. Sorry. Uh, uh, I'm seeing some uh, chat comments that there's an echo. I don't know if there's anything uh, that can be done about that, but I just wanted to let you know um, it was a little audio yeah. thing that came up in chat. Yeah, I'm just that, doing that to keep the. Do you hear me well now? Okay, it's uh, other people are saying there's no echoes, and that sounded good to me. Thank you. Yeah, excellent. Then, so I, uh, as I said, for the the finding the for the associations, uh. Well, we uh, we sample the mesh to matrix data set. We just consider the relation types consider corresponding to the classes. There is, there is no need to consider all the 195 relation types because this is no sense and this will not, not contribute to, to anything. This will add to the complexity of the tax only. Uh, only. So we only consider the the relation type that might work with the classes of the subject and the object. And then we sample the remaining relation types as other. 
So for example, we have we had selected 30, 30 matrices for the relation types that we have done, that we have considered. And for the others, we just consider uh, 30 from all the remaining non-considered relation types. And so we trained the adjusted data set. We, we, choose, we have chosen 30% as the training set and 70% as the test set. And we applied to the model to uh, the association after the, tra the training to classify the extracted association. And then there is a layer of human validation to see if this works or not. Maybe this can be a tool, for example, in Toolforge or something like that. When we upload the list of what the computer has found, what the bot has found, and just people like you just select if it is true or not. And if it is true, they can collab contribute that relation to Wikidata. If it is not, they can discard it. So that's uh, that's a point. Okay. So okay. There is another one that is more very relevant to the four and to the community of library and information science, which is the ref reference identification. So I have developed a bot uh, some years ago for the for identifying uh, references for the Wikidata statements that are related by references. So the, it is sample. So what we do is that we uh, we, ju we just uh, extract the reference uh, Wikidata statements using Spark uh, using Sparkle using the Wikidata query service, and then we identify the most relevant public publications. We find the supporting sentences for claims. We align the PMC ID. This means the public central. ID with the, the Wikidata ID for each reference, and then we obtain the refer the references and add them to Wikidata. So that's the main principle. But the 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 query we are using, it can be just text, just the labels of, from Wikidata, or mainly the mesh keywords. And if we use the mesh keywords. We have kind of a process of how to do that, how to formulate the query. So let's suppose that this uh, this relation does not have a reference in Wikidata. Hepatitis C, medical condition treated, uh, 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 suppose we fear medical condition treated hepatitis C, for example, or hepatitis C drug used for treatment, suppose we fear. So what we do is that we find the mesh equivalent of the subject and the object. And then we, uh, for the relation type, for uh, we use the trainings, the training of the, the mesh to matrix data set. And then using some explainability models like SHAP, we, ex we do some feature extraction to find what, what what is the association that is more relevant for the relation type? So for this case, for example, it shows the color for, for the most relevant association of qualifiers. There is trap therapy and therapeutic cues, it returns. And by that, the query will be just be hepatitis C, uh, drug therapy, mesh, and uh, suppose we hear slash therapeutic use mesh. And we just take that and put it in, in PubMed and search for the reference. And the most relevant reference will be the reference. And that's all. So the, the preliminary edition of the bot exists in, uh, in GitHub as well. Well, it has been launched uh thanks to uh the wikicrate grant initiative two years ago so but it does not have uh the it is not the way i have explained here it is just a preliminary edition of the the bot but we are thinking of developing it further to meet what we are envisioning in the last slide 
Okay, so that's all what well what I ha have to show about uh, the 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 applications or the uses of mesh keywords for uh, for enriching and validating Wikidata. But to do that, to do these applications, we need some tools, at least for bot creation, etc. So I recommend I recommend some of them, and that's why I. I had to show them to you. So the first one is the Wikibase integrator. It is a Python library. And this Python library actually uh, allows you to edit, to add statements, to modify statements, to adjust statements, and to remove statements from Wikidata. So it is kind of consistent uh, Python library. And it is kind of flexible, it is intuitive, and it can be very easy to, uh, to learn for even for new Python users. The second one is the Wikidata Hub, and this Wikidata Hub will allow you to get the external identifier, for example, the mesh ID of a, Wikidata, of a biomedical item in Wikidata, just using this service. So you can write a query using the tutorial that we all have here and you can choose whatever whatever you need as uh, as the type for return the result for example you can return the result at the json uh, layout and so you will get for example you you write for example you, you, i need the 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 uh, the the mesh id of the term for example suppose we here and you get to just the uh, just the mesh id of uh, of that item in wikidata the third one is the wikidata query service and what many people do not know that is that you can embed some queries in python the it is simple you just write your query uh, above and then you write, you click on run, and then the, when you have the results, you have here something called code. And when you click on it, you find Python and you find all the code, customized code about how you put your query in uh, in a Python in a Python code, and reuse that later. And finally, there is the PyPython library that I have discussed before. And that is a very intuitive and a very important uh, Python library for managing and extracting the information, bibliographic information mainly, from PubMed and PubMed Center. So these are the references. Most of them are written by us. So we can go through them and see them in details. And this is some credits for the images I have used so far. Thank you very much. So time now is for having any question or or any comment. I will be happy to answer them. Yeah. Thank you so much. This is great. If if anyone has comments or questions, feel free to just unmute or and go ahead or uh, drop them in chat and I can read them. Whatever works for you. Well, it seems that no one has question for me, maybe. I'll go ahead and ask kind of an organizational question. How did you gather the group of people that are, are working on this project? Yeah, so it's a good, an excellent question. So what we have done uh, is that there are some Wikimedia research community 
So it is active in Wikidata and in other stuff in the mailing list of Wikidata, as well as in Wikimedia conferences. So they are easy to reach and they are flexible enough to co collaborate. So you can contact them directly and ask for them. And the second thing that we have, because people are very shy in the developing world, especially in Africa, is that we make consortiums. And by consortium, I mean that a gathering a group of people that work on a given topic. For example, the machine learning community, the, biomed the machine learning in the biomedical context the, uh, thing. For example, the Sison period or the Masakana, which is the NLP community in Africa. So by doing that, people can get in, mainly because there is some kind of need for support. They need support, so it, they ca it can be useful for them. And second, because uh, there is some huge work that can be done by a lot of people. For example, a work for 50 people or 60 people. And by that, you can share your work in these kind of, of groups, and then you easily get some collaborators. And that's why we have succeeded kind of uh, for having good, and I think that esteemed uh, African researchers with us. Um, we do have a question in chat. Did you need to address potential spam or manipulation of mesh headings in the medical literature, or did you rely on using reputable domains? Yeah, that, that's a very important question, indeed. Well, uh, actually, it depends. Uh, well, the, the mesh, uh, the, we, we are mainly using the, the, the mass effect, the effect of the mass. This means that we are, we are using a probabilistic approach. This implies that having many, pap many papers having a given association means that this association is, is correct. I know that this is not always correct, but we are doing that to avoid any manipulation because manipulation is, is kind of possible at the micro scale, but at the macro scale, it is kind of difficult. Uh, the mesh headings may mainly use uh, May, may are mainly generated by by uh, NCBI uh, kind of uh, curators or uh, or staff or staff or uh, employees. So it is kind of reliable. So there is there is no such huge mistakes to consider. The mistakes are mainly minor. But there is another thing that I have kind of briefly evocated, and it is important. It is the retracted and partially retracted literature. So luckily, PubMed uh, kind of uh, flag the papers that have been retracted or partially retracted in PubMed. And so we use that flag to prevent using information that is not relevant that is retracted from uh, from the journal that published that or uh, or that had been kind of reported for misconduct so i think this is supported and this is this flag is mainly important for us for filtering false information So we have another question. Have you used any tools to clean data um, pre-intake or something like that, maybe? Well, I did explain that a little bit. So mesh keywords are uh, predefined keywords. This means that there is a dictionary called mesh, 
and it is used to to kind of uh, assign. They are assigned keywords that that are assigned. So it is kind of a drop, uh, a drop based or a drag drop thing. So there there is no. Uh, it is it is not a human generated kind of keyword. It is not fully human human generated. So it is mainly uh, uh, an item chosen from a list. So there is not such uh, such uh, a problem of uh, of having some uh, some kind of irrelevant words or some uh, wrong words or some mistakenly some mistakenly read, written words, some typos, etc. So it is predefined. And if it is predefined, so it uses the same word for the same item for every paper. So it is a controlled keyword. keyword. And uh, I know that even for the library and information science community, controlled keywords uh, are not very popular as, uh, as the resource to use. So mainly we should think more about that. So controlled keyword, when you use con controlled keyword, you are sure that there is no redundancy, there is no uh, kind of uh, uh, kind of mess around the data, etc. So it is kind of more clean than, for example, the human generated uh, the human generated keywords or the abstract or other things. And that's why we did not use any uh, pre-processing tools for that. Any other questions or comments? Or announcements? Okay, not hearing or seeing any in chat. Uh, thank you again for presenting. Thank you to the 2022 LD4 conference for uh, giving us this time slot. And thank you to everyone who attended. I, this was a great talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.